um, the Bible from Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we are headed to the very end, the very last thing penned somewhere around 95 to 90, 97 A.D. when John penned the words that we find in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and so we're, we've been chronologically following a study all the way through the Bible. And uh, there's a lot of times when you open up your Bible, and, and, and I can remember um, when I was younger, I was, I'm going to read certain parts of the Bible and open it up. And I might be able to make sense of what some of it is saying, but there are a lot of times that, how, what is that really about? And what per, what's the purpose? And what does that mean? And, uh, and to know how it chronologically fit from creation all the way through time to now, we, are, we just wrapped up on our Wednesday night class the study of the book of Acts, which is the history of the church, the beginning of the church. Um, in Acts chapter 2, and then the progression of what God had did in the first century um, as, as the gospel began to spread all around the world. And so we've just concluded the book of Acts. The apostle Paul is now in prison. He, he's, he's been arrested. He's being taken to Rome. And uh, the last chapter of Acts talked about him arriving in Rome. And, uh, and so now he begins to write letters to churches, some that he had visited, um, most that he had visited before, many of them where he planted churches in those cities, um, but Colossae is a little bit different. We have no record of Paul ever going to the church in Colossae. Um, he was in the area. Um, that The purple line there is his third missionary journey um, and uh, that we have the end of the book of Acts. And uh, you see Colossae there right in the middle of, of Eastern Asia. And uh, it, we never have record of Paul going to Colossae, uh, but he was in that area a lot. So chances are he, he probably did visit there, um, but uh, he, remember he spent two years in Ephesus, or three years in Ephesus, and uh, so during that time he most likely would have been traveling around to a lot of the cities that were fairly nearby. Um, but when we look at before we start really looking at what's in the text, I like to get a little bit of an understanding of the place. Just what exactly was this city of Colossae? Why is it so important that Paul wrote a letter to the Christians in this, this city? And at least to give us a little bit of a, an idea of what, what this city was like. And so the city of Colossae, it's, it's located in a valley. I don't know if you saw it on the map there. Uh, there's a river that actually runs right through the city. Um, it's the it's the Lycus River. That that word Lycus uh, in Greek uh, is the word wolf. It's the Wolf River, uh, and uh, it ran right through the city. But the city of Colossae shares that valley with two other cities. There was Laodicea on one side. And, and Hierapolis on the other side. And both of those cities are mentioned in Paul's letter to the Colossians um, in uh, chapter 2 and in chapter 4. And so um, all three of these cities were significant cities. Colossae at one point was known as a very significant city. In 450 B.C., um, Herodotus calls, he, he's a, a historian, he, he calls uh, the city of Colossae a great city in Phrygia. Um, we have a little bit uh, uh, about the same time. Um, Xenophon, uh, another contemporary at that time, refers to the, the city of Colossae as a populous city. So it was a big growing city at that time. But it, by the time the Apostle Paul was there in the first century, things had begun to change. So four or five hundred years now have passed. And uh, and we think, when we're studying through history like this, 500 years, you know, it doesn't seem, we've gone all the way back, you know, we're looking back in the time of, uh, uh, what, 1500 B.C. with, with, uh, with Abraham or Moses. And so 500 years doesn't seem a lot, but put it in context, put it in context with our own nation. How long have we been here as the United States of America? Um, and uh, less than 300 years. And, and so these are great spans of time. Over 500 years goes by, and Strabo, um, in the first century, he describes Colossae as a small town. Things have changed in Colossae, and so um, there's some reasons for that. 
Uh, but we even see the decline even more by the second century in 140 AD. We see that Ptolemy, when he is describing all of the cities in this region, he doesn't even mention the city of Colossae. It's almost as though it wasn't there anymore. It had become so insignificant. And so um, it was a declining city. We're familiar with that. We see those all around us all the time. Different things happen and cities begin to decline. Um, there was the main road, the main road that went from the city of Ephesus, which was the port city that ran right to uh, the, the Euphrates River. So you can imagine all the imports. There were imports coming from, from Alexandria in, 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 uh, in Egypt. Um, that will remember Paul when he was taken to Rome in Acts chapter 28. They got on an Alexandrian ship um, that was coming from Egypt. Um, they would have been coming from all over Spain and all over that part of the world. They would dock in Ephesus. They would transport down this road that went through Colossae to the Euphrates River. It was the main river, the way that would take those goods uh, many different places up in, into Asia. And so um, it was a very significant thing. The problem is, is that it sh um, uh, the same road also went through Laodicea. And when the Romans began to build their roads, all the Roman roads, they also built five other significant roads that intersected the city of Laodicea. And, and all of a sudden, Laodicea became a more significant city than Colossae. And so Laodicea began to, to grow, and, and Colossae began to decline. That's one of the main reasons for it. And so Colossae itself was known for its wool. This is one of the main things that they were known for. Um, they were known for the, the hot healing springs. Um, this was something that was a little bit closer to Laodicea, even when Jesus, uh, the letter that Jesus sends to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 2. And um, he talks to them about being, whether you were, I wish you were either hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. Um, there, there were the hot springs that were right there close to Laodicea, not far from Colossae as well, that were known for, <coughs> or people came for their um, uh, so-called healing powers uh, that were there in those, the mineral um, springs. Um, we're in this part of the country, we're kind of familiar with, with that. Um, the, uh, but they were also known for their world-famous dyes. They were a wool industry, and famous for their dyes. Remember Lydia, who was the seller of purple? There was a, there was a um, shellfish that was found only in the waters in this area that um, they got a purple dye from. And it was something that even the emperor of Rome, his robe was dyed with this dye because it was so rare. And it was, it was that image of wealth. And, uh, and so that's, that's the place. That's uh, when, and, and one of the reasons that I go through some of the history and things of places like this, because a lot of the times people, when they open up the Bible, it just becomes a storybook. And this isn't a storybook. It's a history book. It is, it is they're, they're, every single word that we have has been verified by history. And it's, it's amazing. The things that, there are some things still in Scripture that historians have never seen before. And so that's where critics begin to challenge the scriptures, is where they'll see, well, that city, that it's never existed. There's never not anywhere that we have any record historically of that city or that king or somebody that's ever existed. Then all of a sudden, through archaeology, we'll, they'll find something, and, and oh, well, there he is. That was like King Sennacherib of, of the Assyrians um, for for a long time, critics said, you see, the Bible, it's just, it's just stories. They make up names. Sennacherib was never a king of Assyria. There's no record of that. And then all of a sudden, through archaeology, they find what now is Sennacherib's prism, which showed his, his uh, exploits as he was conquering all the cities in Judah. And it fit exactly what Scripture said. And, and so it just verifies Scripture time after time. And that's why I do this, because it's not just a storybook. It's not just a fairy tale. It is a history, extremely accurate history book. And as we, we follow through it, we're able to see, um, some, you learn more, a lot about the rest of the world, while the Bible is zoomed in on one little piece of the world. 
and, and that's in around, um, for the most part, in Judea, and then as the church spread into um, Asia and Europe. And so that's, that's the city of Colossae. Now remember the context, and this is significant. The context, Paul is under arrest. Um, this was a horrible trip. Uh, the, sh- the, the, the trip from, from Caesarea um, all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, um, the, the shipwreck that occurred. We, we talked about all of this uh, Wednesday night in the end of the book of Acts. Um, and, and all of the things that, that took place. It was a seven to eight month trip. Um, but they did spend the winter uh, there uh, uh, in to, to the winter months to try to, to uh, not have to travel in the, in the bad seas. But Paul is under arrest, technically. Um, he was arrested by the Romans uh, and taken into custody, but the, the Jews who had a problem with what Paul was doing couldn't prove that he had done anything wrong, because he hadn't. And, but Paul, he appealed to Caesar. I want my case to be heard before Caesar. And then, since Paul was a Roman citizen, th- they had to, by Roman law. And so um, even King Agrippa said, if he wouldn't have appealed to Caesar, we would have let him go free. But Paul knew, Paul wanted to be in Rome. He wanted to preach the gospel of Christ in Rome. And so why not do it on the Romans' expense by going on, even as a prisoner, going on their their boat. And so that's how he gets to Rome. But he was given a lot of freedoms because they couldn't prove that he'd done anything wrong. They gave him a lot of freedoms, even as being, being under arrest, Roman arrest. We see, saw in Acts chapter 28 and verse 30 that he was allowed to rent his own place. He stayed in a place that he rented. But we also saw in verse 16 that he was under constant Roman guard. And so he was, he was in custody, but he was given a lot of freedoms um, at the same time. Now, the fact that Paul is writing this letter now to the church in Colossae, as you read through the entire letter, um, we've spent a lot of time on Sunday mornings in our, in our um, Kingdom Living series dealing with these first few chapters of Colossians, and we've talked about it's saturated with this is why we follow Christ, because of how amazing Jesus Christ is, and that's what the entire letter is about. It's an encouragement to these brethren of stay strong. Be strong, because what was beginning to happen right about this time to Christians in the Roman Empire? Persecution. The Roman Empire was beginning to persecute Christians. Um, It's not very long until Nero is going to be putting Christians on stakes and lighting the cities of of the city of Rome uh, at night by burning Christians on stakes. That's all historically. Um, uh, the, we have historical uh, writing and, and, and evidence of that. And so that's the time, that, this is what's about to happen in the time of the life of Christians. That's why later on the book of Revelation is going to be written, is to give encouragement, to say we, God knows that this persecution is coming, but there's a purpose for it. Uh, and even if you lose your life as faithful to Christ, that's actually victory because of the hope that we have of what's after this life. And so, um, and then Paul is writing to encourage them as well uh, at this time. Paul knew that he was where God wanted him to be. He knew that he was in the place where God wanted him to be. Now, now he's like, how can I serve God where I am now? I'm under Roman arrest. A lot of people would use that as an excuse. They'd say, I'm a prisoner. What can I do? But not Paul. He continued to be a servant of God. I think that's something all of us have to keep in mind as well. Why are we where we are today? Uh, And and while we're here, I just did a quick scan through the directory. I did that this morning. We have people sitting in this room right now who are from Louisiana and Chicago and Tennessee and Colorado and Oklahoma and Texas and Wisconsin and in Kansas and Washington State and Iowa and California and there's probably others as well. And why are we all here? What can we do while we're here? Um, and we have a purpose of continuing to serve God where we are and doing what we can. And that's what Paul does. So I'm, I'm really going to be going through 
these first couple of chapters, like I said, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about several things in these chapters the last um, few weeks uh, in, in my sermon series. And so I'm going to give, it's, I'm going to go pretty quick. So if you open, you want to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians in chapter 1, um, you can follow through. I've put the verses next to each thing that I'm going to put on the screen, but I'm going to go through it pretty quick. But here's what's amazing. In the situation that Paul found himself in as a prisoner, I want you to notice where the mindset of Paul was. It wasn't, woe is me. It wasn't making up excuses. It was, as a matter of fact, notice the very first thing that Paul does. In verses 3 through 8 of Colossians chapter 1, he, the first thing he does is he shows all the things that he's thankful for. And, and that's what his attitude is. It doesn't matter. I have just gone through shipwreck. I, he, we, we read about the, 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 the snake bite that he received that should have killed him, according to the natives of the island that they were on. And, and, uh, and so he's been, through, he's been through so much. And right when he gets to Rome and starts writing this letter, the first thing that he writes is, I'm thankful. And so here are the things that he's thankful for. He says, first he gives thanks to God in verse 3. He says in verse 3, we're praying always for you. He's thankful to God for the Christians in Colossae. In verse 5, he's thankful for the hope laid up in heaven. Also in verse 5, he's thankful for the word of truth, which is the gospel. In verse 6, he's, uh, he's thankful that those Christians in Colossae were bearing fruit and they were increasing. In verse 7, he was thankful for the man named Epaphras, um, who is, he says, is our beloved bondservant. Um, in verse 8, he's, he's thankful for the love, uh, their love in the Spirit. Everything he goes through at the very beginning of this, I am so thankful to God for all of these things. You think, but Paul, look at the situation you're in. How can you be so thankful when you've gone through so many bad things? And again, that's kingdom living. That's understanding that when, as we serve the king of kings, our perspective on life completely changes because it's not about what's happening around me here. It's about what I am doing here that is going to advance the kingdom of God and also the reward that, that I will receive because of that. And so, uh, and that's what Paul continues to focus on. Then, you would think eventually, Paul, he's going to talk about um, himself and his horrible trip that he, because when you make a trip and you write to your friends, you usually include all the, well, we had a flat tire in this city, and we, we, and you go through all the things that went on. Paul doesn't, he doesn't even mention that stuff in this letter. The next thing he does is he tells the Christians in Colossae, I'm concerned for you. My concern for you is, is what was, was, uh, something that was, was on his heart. In verse 9, he says, we have not ceased praying for you. Also in verse 9, Paul wants them to, to be filled with no, the knowledge of God's will. That's Paul's concern for them. Paul's saying, if there's something that I want more than anything else, is that you will know the will of God. What does God want for you? I want you to know that, because if you know that, then all of the other things that you're dealing with in life begin to take care of themselves because you know what God's will is for you. Then in verse 10, Paul wants them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. He's concerned. Make sure that you are following God's will. I want you to know what it is first, but now I want to make sure that you are, are living it and doing it. Also in verse 10, Paul wants them to, to please God in every way. In verse 11, he's, Paul wants them to be strengthened, and he mentions three things. I want you to be strengthened with steadfastness, with patience, and with joy. And when you think about what Christians were dealing with in that time, those are three big things. Steadfastness, perseverance. The, you're going to be going through some tough things. There's going to be a lot of persecution you're going to be faced with. I want you to be steadfast. Stand strong. I want you to be patient. It may not seem like things are going right. It may even seem like your, our enemy is winning, but he's not. God is in control. And, and so be patient and be joyful. How can we be joyful? 
in a time when we're struggling. And that's what James writes about in, in his letter, in James chapter 1, that uh, w- with all joy in, during various trials and tribulations. And how is that possible? It's possible because we know that the pain and the suffering that's happening here in this life is not what it's all about. And it actually helps us to focus our mind and remind us of there is something better than this. If I keep my focus, if I'm steadfast, if I'm patient, I can have joy and I can have peace. That's something that people, people who, do, who, who are not children of God cannot understand the peace that you have when, when you become a child of God. Uh, the, the challenges and the struggles and the heartache and all that kind of thing. I, I see Christians, that they, I go to visit them in the hospital, and they cheer me up more than I cheer them up because they have a peace. It, it's not about this. Yeah, I'm hurting right now, but that's not what it's about. There's something bigger and better than all of this, and so that's what, what Paul is wanting them to have. Then Paul's next focus is look at all the good things that God has done. See, this is not where the mind of most people go when they've just been in a shipwreck and been bitten by poisonous snakes and been arrested and, and all that. This is not where their mind goes. Is God has done so many good. Most people, they begin to question God. They begin, why would God allow something like this? This was the biggest thing. We just did our door knocking campaign, and we asked people that one question. If, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? And the number one question we got, if God really is a loving God, then why is there pain and suffering in the world? And so we're going to answer that question in our gospel meeting next month. We're going to look at that very specific thing, and, and because there is, it's a very important question. And there is a very, very important answer to that question. But God gives us the answer for, for why we see what's going on around us. And so um, Paul's focus, instead of looking at the negative, he immediately turns, look at what God has done. And here's what he says in verse 12. He says, God qualified us to share in the inheritance. We have now been given, we have been adopted as sons of God, which means we now have a chance to share in his eternal inheritance. In verse 13, he rescued us from darkness. We have sin, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But we have that gift of God, that gift of grace that gives life, if we're obedient to the will of God. And, and so we're in darkness. Sin will leave us in a state of darkness. And God knew, from the very beginning God knew. I'm, he was planning this the whole time. I am going to create a way so that man is going to be able to be reconnected with me. And that's what he does through his son Jesus, with his sacrifice on the cross. And so we see, we see uh, the gift, uh, the, the, the process of God rescuing us it's like sin we talked about this in our in the sermon series it's like god sending in that special elite team in as if you were a prisoner in some foreign land and and uh, they send in a a special forces team to rescue you and to pull you out of that place that's the type of terminology that he's using here is that you have been rescued you have been freed god has pulled you from that place of darkness, but then he also tells us where he put us in verse 13. He transferred us over into his kingdom. Now, this is for those who have made that decision, we're going to see in chapter 2, of becoming a Christian, of becoming a disciple of Jesus. And so this isn't for everybody in the world. He, remember who Paul's writing to. You have to keep the context in mind. Paul's writing this letter to to people who have already obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have already had their sins cleansed. And so he's reminding them, this is what has happened. He pulled you out of darkness, and he has placed you into the kingdom of his son. And so we now belong. Our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul tells us in Philippians. And so um, verse 14 tells us that God redeemed us. 
He paid a price so that we could be freed. It's like a slave on the slave block. And we were slaves to sin. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus, he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so because of that, it's he paid the ransom. It was we were on the slave block, God looked at us and said, I will purchase them with the blood of my son. And it set us free. And so that's the picture of being redeemed. And then verse 14, the, the result of all of that is we were forgiven of our sins. By obedience to the call of the gospel, through the grace of God, he forgave. He's willing to forgive our sins. It doesn't matter what I've done. It doesn't matter where I've been. It doesn't matter what's happened in my life up to this point. God has promised me, if you do my will, I'll forget it all. It'll all be gone. And you can start over with me. And so that's, again, it's what Paul is continuing to remind these Christians about. Then, he goes through, and this is, this is how amazing Jesus himself is. That gift that was given so that we could be saved. Again, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. He came to this earth physically so that we could see, what is God like? We saw it. We saw, well, we didn't with our own eyes, but in the first century, those that were there, they were able to see the image of the invisible God right before them. And so they saw how God walked. They saw how God talked. They saw how he, he lived his life and was completely obedient to the will of his Father in heaven. He is the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16, he, uh, all things were created by him. Something that John told us in John chapter 1 as well, um, that, that Jesus... The, the Son of God was, was one of the most uh, vital parts of the process of creation that we see back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Um, not only did he create all things, but in verse 17, he sustains all things. In verse 18, he is head of the body, that is the church. Verse 18 as well, he is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the first one to ever die, to be brought to life, to never die again. Now, other people had been raised from the dead through the power of God, but Jesus is the first one to ever die, to never die again, to live eternally. And so he is the firstborn from the dead. Verse 20, he reconciled us with his blood. Verse 22, he presents, presents us to his Father as holy and blameless. That's what Jesus has done for us. Then... Verses 24 through 29, and this is what's, uh, in verse 24, Paul says, now I rejoice in my suffering. I rejoice in my suffering. How's that possible? If you ask Paul that at this point, Paul would say, um, did you not just read what I just told you of how amazing God is and what Jesus did for us? That is why I can rejoice in my suffering. I am suffering for him. I am suffering. We talk about our military and what they're willing to go out and do. And when you talk to them, they, they why are you willing to suffer like that and to go through this? I'm fighting for a cause. I'm fighting for freedom. I'm fighting for my country. I'm fighting for what I believe in. So why is it so strange for us to look at Paul in a, in a situation like this and say, Paul, why do you go through the suffering? Why do you go through the pain? Why do you go through all of this struggle and trial and persecution? He, he just told us. He said, I'm fighting for a cause. I'm fighting for a purpose. I am fighting because of what Jesus Christ, we, I'm fighting for freedom. Freedom from sin. And I want as many people as possible to hear that message so that they too will change their life and be able to have that same gift as well. And so that's, that's what Paul, I rejoice in my suffering. Paul did whatever was necessary for the sake of his body. What he tells us there in verse, verse 24, the body of Christ. I do whatever is necessary. And then he begins to focus on the good side of suffering. He tells us in verse 25, it's an honor to be made a minister. 
It's an honor to preach the word of God. Verse 26, it's an honor to know what generations before long to know. All the generations that came before, they didn't know what the message of Christ was going to be. He said, man, it's an honor to know what they never knew. It's an honor, verse 27, to be selected to preach to the Gentiles. It's an honor, verse 29, to have God's power mightily working in me. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to live this life for God because what he was willing to do for me. He was willing to send his own son to die for me. So now, what would I be willing to do in return? Whatever it takes. And that's what Paul is is reminding them. Again, he's trying to give them an example for what they themselves need to be doing and the way they need to be living. We get to chapter 2. We're not going to get all the way through this. We're about out of time. All the way through chapter 2. I want to jump forward. He talks about his concern for the brethren again in verses 1 through 8. I'm going to go through this pretty quick just so I can... So I want to look at this right here real quick. Verses 9 through 10. Circumcision not made with hands. We had circumcision in the Old Testament. Circumcision in the Old Testament was the sign that was given by God to the Jews as this is what identified you as a child of God. It was the, it was the, the sign that was given to Abraham, passed through, through the generations. But it was something that was done by hands, by the, the, by the priests. It was something that men did, the actual physical surgery of circumcision that took place there. So what Paul is describing now is that the physical surgery is really not what God has in mind anymore. And below this, he's going to talk about the old law of Moses and how it has been put to death. It, is, it has... Um, been canceled out, um, that, that certificate of, of death. And so, but today, describing a circumcision that is not made with hands. In other words, this is something that is now done by God. And it's done by God, how? Well, look, starting in verse 9, it says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions. So all that Paul's been talking about up to this point, all the things that God has done, all the things that Christ has done, for those that are children of God who have done, who have done this, they have been buried with Christ in baptism and had their sins washed away. Now they have all of this hope. And all of these promises. And, 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 and Paul, so Paul is reminding them, remember when all of this happened? It happened when you were buried with Christ into his death. When you were baptized into his death. That's when God took you and noted, he noted, realized that you truly trust me. You're truly willing to give yourself to me. And it's seen in the image of us being buried, being raised to walk in newness of life, Paul writes in Romans chapter 6. And so it's a it's the process of obedience to the gospel of Jesus that makes all of the rest of this amazing stuff possible. It's not available to anyone else that is not in the body of Christ. That's why we do what we do. That's why we teach the people that we teach the same way that Paul did because it's worth it. What the, the reward that is, is there for those that hear and obey, that's what we want to make sure we are providing for everyone else. Now, you, they've got to make their own decision. God left it up. God didn't make anybody require them to do anything. They've got to make their own decision. But this is why we do it. Why do we go through the ridicule? Why do we go through people making fun of us as Christians? Why, why would you want to do that? Because it's worth it when you understand what Christ has done for us. And so that's the first couple of chapters, in a nutshell, of what Paul's doing.
And where he could be focused on all the negative, that's the last place his mind goes. And so that's the kind of leader I want to learn from. And that's what we'll, we'll continue Wednesday night. We'll look at chapters 3 and 4 and what Paul continues then following uh, what we just, we just saw there in chapter 2.